Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Financial Remedies Journal webinar on intervener claims, who, what, when, and why. The question of what is an intervener claim can probably be answered quite shortly. This relates to financial remedy claims where a third party has been joined for the determination of a preliminary issue such as who is the beneficial owner of a property. Anybody who's been involved in these cases will know that how high stakes they are. This is litigation read in tooth and claw. The cases can be legally and factually complex. They involve significant cost and delay, and the outcomes are often binary in terms of the court's declaration and also costs. I'm delighted to introduce our panel for today's uh, discussion, which is gonna last about 45 minutes. So we're gonna be wrapping up at about 1.45. We're each going to speak for about eight minutes on one topic. And at the end, there's going to be a sort of roundtable discussion. If anybody wants to raise any questions, please use the uh, Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom call. First of all, there'll be uh, Rhys Taylor, who's a barrister with 36 family in London. Rhys sits as a recorder, an arbitrator. He's the journal editor of the Financial Remedies Journal and the contributing editor of the Red Book. The new Red Book, which is coming out shortly this year, has for the first time a new procedural table for intervener claims written by Rees, and he will today be speaking about when you should join a third party as an intervener. Second will be Max Turnell, who's a barrister with One King's Bench Walk in London. Max is a rising star in financial remedies. He already has an impressive list of reported cases, including the recent saga of Barclay and Barclay. Max is going to be speaking about directions which should be made in intervener cases. Thirdly, I'm going to be speaking, my name is Alexander Chandler, I'm a King's Counsel at 1KBW with Max, specialising in financial remedies to Lauter and Schedule 1. I also sit as a recorder, arbitrator, private FDR judge. I am the co-author with Max of the Dictionary of Talata and Inheritance Claim, which is just as we speak gone to press and is coming into its second edition this has, for the very first time, a, a whole section on intervener claims. So, if you have been affected by the issues discussed in today's webinar, can I encourage you very strongly to go online to Class Legal or go to one of your good bookshops and buy at least one copy of the second edition of the Dictionary of Talata and Inheritance Claims. Last, but not very much not least, we have Helen Brander, who's a barrister at Pump Court Chambers, specialising in financial remedies and also TEP work, trusts and estate practice. Helen sits as a deputy district judge and arbitrator. She'll be known to many of you for, uh, for her excellent articles on issues such as cryptocurrency. Helen will be speaking on costs, offers and rules. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Reese, who will be speaking, as I say, about when you should join a third party as an intervener. Thank you very much, Alex, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, the technical answer as to when you are, are to join uh, an intervener is to be found in Rule 9.26B1, and we're told that uh, we join a potential intervener when it is desirable to do so. Uh, I contrast uh, that test of desirable with a higher test or the instruction of an expert when it is necessary. It'll be interesting at the end, uh, possibly to uh, have views from others as to what the experience is, but certainly my experience over many years of doing this kinds of litigation is that I think many people with the glorious benefit of hindsight might have reflected as to whether it had been desirable them to get involved in this kind of uh, litigation. So often um, the, uh, the costs which are incurred in this kind of um, diversion in financial remedy proceedings um, take on a life of their own <clears throat> and the litigation takes on a life of its own aside from the attempts to try and resolve um, the, the, the main claim. And so um, I think one has to uh, ponder very, very carefully the wisdom and the proportionality and where you hope to end up um, with all of this. I've seen some cases down the years, uh, Helen's going to talk about costs, but I've seen some cases down the years even where um, at the end of the bloodletting that has been the intervener claim, 
and the judge adjourns the question of costs over into the financial remedy proceedings. And so that is just a liability then on, on the balance sheet and something um, to be debated in, in the main proceedings um, and adds to the headache of it all. And so I think one needs to think very, very carefully about the word desirable in this context. But sometimes um, the issues are such that uh, one needs to look into the abyss of all of this and decide whether or not one's going to go for it. And what I'm going to do is uh, is briefly um, cover two areas. One is uh, property claims. And then the other one is what to do about the bank of mum and dad and loans. Turning to property, um, Many of you will be uh, familiar with the principle laid down in the Fisher Meredith case many years ago, that if you're trying to say that the beneficial interest is different to the legal title, then the burden of proof and the burden of doing something about all of this rests on you. And so if you say, well, although um, it's in uh, it's in granny's name, really, it belongs to us. Um, then you need to set that claim up and you need to um, apply for the joinder uh, and seek directions. Uh, but it's not as straightforward as that, because sometimes, even though you say um, with force uh, and perhaps with evidence um, that supports what you're saying, that the beneficial in in interest is different to the legal title, I think you should also be asking yourself whether there are enough uh, what I'll call free assets already in the matrimonial pot that aren't mixed up uh, with the legal ownership of third party, which would allow the court to make a division of assets um, without reference to that third party asset. And so you might say, well, look, um, we say that property over there really belongs to us. Uh, but in fact, the court might just make a finding about it within the proceedings into part A between the proceedings and then um, divide the assets accordingly. Wouldn't be binding on the third party, but it doesn't need to be. You can resolve the issue as between the parties without having brought in um, an additional um, party, an additional set of lawyers, an additional costs peril uh, and all the, the complications that flow from that. So, um, if you say um, the beneficial interest is different to the legal title, you've got to think, right, what am I doing? Um, you you might need to do to consider joinder, but look at the broader canvas and ask yourself, can we can we get through this without joinder? Turning then to loans, and I think loans are, are particularly thorny. We're told um, often that family law is not an island and that we... Um, uh, we uh, have the same law as in uh, different uh, divisions of, of um, the High Court uh, and and courts generally. Um, but there is a there is a bit of um, the island, I think, when it comes to family loans, because um, you can have a situation where the ba the bank of mum and dad has put up a significant sum of money. They may be very wealthy, and the court will look at that through the perspective of the, uh, in particular, the case of P&Q, uh, which many of you uh, will be familiar with, and will be asking, well, um, is, this, is this a hard debt or is it a soft debt? Will it really be required um, to um, uh, be repaid? And I think that um, with the best of intentions um, in, in setting out the uh, the criteria in P&Q, it may actually be encouraging some people um, uh, when they're advancing money to their children to think about commercialising the appearance of the advancement of that, of that money um, so that they're able to um, uh, pursue it in, uh, in financial remedy proceedings should that eventuality ever arise. So one looks um, at at P and Q and the factors very briefly. Um, if it's a hard uh, obligation, um, does it feel like a commercial arrangement? Is there a written agreement? It, uh, has there been a written 
demand or a threat of litigation or actual litigation. And those kinds of features um, uh, are such um, that uh, someone who um, has the benefit of uh, a loan might say, well, actually, I want to intervene in these proceedings because I want to demonstrate by reference to P and Q um, that I'm serious about getting my money back. I'm not just going to sit there and let the um, family court divide this up. Um, uh, but again, and I think even more so in the loan context than the property context, one needs to think long and hard about the proportionality of all of this. I think it is going to be the exception um, to the rule that it will be desirable to join the bank of mum and dad um, on questions of um, what loans are, are owed. It, it can just be dealt with usually um, uh, between the parties. Mum and dad can be witnesses um, and that ordinarily would be enough. And so, um, you know, it, it's fascinating litigation when one is instructed in it and uh, and sometimes it has to be done. But I think um, on the question of when it should be done, one needs to ponder very carefully indeed the word desirable. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rhys. Um, I'm now turning to Max, uh, who's going to be speaking about directions. Yes. So what directions should be made? Well, a fairly glib answer. The first direction is, of course, joinder, permission, giving permission to interveners to intervene. Now, Rhys has spoken about the considerations that, that would apply to this. It, it's important to remember that the FPR rather than the CPR will apply to any intervener claim. So uh, in Goldstone and Goldstone, Lord Justice Thorpe explained why, which is essentially the preliminary issue trial, this sort of importation of, of, a, of a dispute, it's pendant on the on the origination originating application it has no independent existence so it's the reason why we use fpr 9.26b which is pretty much a copy of the cpr 19.2 that gives the court quite wide powers to direct the uh, third parties to be added and removed um, whether by application or, or its own initiative and make consequential directions but these powers are not exercised in a vacuum. Now, the seminal decision on case management remains, of course, TL and ML. Um, this may well be one of um, Sir Nicholas Mostyn's cases, which will really will stand the test of time, notwithstanding um, the sort of what short, short term memory family lawyers have for cases. Uh, TL and ML uh, suggest a, a four pronged way of doing things. One, joinder at the earliest opportunity. Two, points of claim, points of defence, so to pleadings. Three, witness statements. And four, the hearing of a dispute prior to FDR as a preliminary issue. Um, now, the TL and ML, one of the reasons why it's to the take the time it's been endorsed by Mr Justice Munby and a &A and by the Court of Appeal at least twice. Um, but it, it's important to um, observe that it does not impose a straitjacket. Of course, the, the theme must be vigorous judicial case management, and that's always going to be vital, but appropriate directions to be given in any particular case must reflect um, the appraisal by the case managing judge of how, given the forensic realities of, of the particular case, the issues can best be resolved in the most just, effective and expedition manner, i.e., following the overriding objective. But TL and ML very much remains the archetype. So uh, unpacking those four items. So joiner at the earliest opportunity, um, at which time one would expect um, the extant evidence to be served on interveners. So the F FBR 9.26B3A um, states the court may give consequential directions about the service of, of a copy of the application form and other relevant documents on the new party. Um, now, I think it's important there just to point out that it doesn't follow that an intervener should receive wholesale disclosure. So there's no real reason why they should be given full copies of For Me, bank statements going back the last year, so on and so forth. Um, and, and so one could see an iteration of that in the case of, um, I'm going to murder the pronunciation, but um, Boglia, Boglia Bova, um, where Mr Justice Peel 
a refused a specific disclosure application of the intervener called private bank saying you're, you're a bank you don't need the bundle and various other documents that, that they were seeking um who then points of claim points of defense and if so advised points in reply um taken together let's call them pleadings now reiterating the basics they are exactly what they say on the tip tin um points um we're not seeking witness statements they should not contain evidence they should not include exhibits they should only assert um in a in a relatively pointed way the essential facts and legal principles necessary to found a party's case so typically in an intervener dispute it will be a claim based on a constructive trust or proprietary estoppel so what it would be targeted points uh, and particulars as to the the uh, circumstances of any discussions and or arguments, um, that's what should be in there. Um, you shouldn't be citing case law. Uh, we're not going to be interested in about a party's employment background. It's difficult to see how that would be particularly relevant. Um, you may want to identify certain documents relied upon, but, but perhaps actually in a similar way that we shouldn't be doing with skeleton arguments. We don't want wholesale copying and pasting. Um, and, and the, the reason why this is an area that seems to be often forgotten, and certainly cases which I've been involved in the last year, you sort of turn up at a preliminary issue hearing and find we've just had witness statements. Um, not having points of claim creates muddle, confusion and ambiguity. And, and so there are a line of authorities that, that, that sort of demonstrate that. Um, and uh, one of the one of the ones that comes immediately to mind is Udin and Udin in 2022, where the TL, TL and ML procedure was not followed and the spouses claims the premier issue hearing were resolved together in one massive unwieldy, yielding at, un, unwieldy hearing at the end. Um, the, the essence of doing points of claim at a very early stage, it, it really exposes parties claims to an intellectual discipline, which um, allows sort of the, the, the spectrum of, of the dispute to be set. Now, a, a, a corollary of that is disclosure. Now, that's not something that was specifically mentioned in TL and ML, um, but disclosure may be by standard disclosure thereafter pleadings. So standard disclosure requires each side to declare a search has been undertaken for the existence of documents which tend to disport or even undermine um, their case and also their opponents. There is a, a nifty form N265, which um, a little bit like um, the statement of costs is, or, or, or part 36 claims um, is something that they might be worth using for that. Um, alternatively, disclosure can be by specific documents or even via questionnaires. It's something that very much can be, a, it's a case management decision to be made. But, but it's important, I think, for the disclosure to follow the points of claim and points of defence, points of reply, if, if necessary, um, to work out the, the, the spectrum of the dispute. Thereafter, witness statements. Um, ordinarily, it's not good practice for the court to be invited to order the parties to exchange points of claim with witness statements. It, it sort of misunderstands the requirement for pleadings to first set out the claim um, and secondly it, um, for disclosure and third witness statements to be in exchange once those respective cases have been understood by each side and all relevant documents are in play so so it should be points of claim corollary disclosure and, and then evidence in the form of witness statements um, drawing all those strands together um, and the fourth strand of TL and, and ML is the hearing of the dispute prior to FDR as a preliminary issue. Um, now, the reason Mr. Justice Mostyn said that in TL and ML is because the parties will then know at an early stage whether or not the property in question falls within the disposable powers of the court, um, therefore allowing a meaningful FDR to take place. It also means the expensive attendance of, of the third party um, at, a, at a lengthy trial could be avoided. Um, that is not, however, particularly cost effective um, or, or indeed time efficient these days. Uh, and so there are a line of authorities, particularly starting with Shield and Shield. In fact, there are 
two judgments in Shield and Shield, one by Mr. Justice Holman and one by Mr. N Nicholas um, Francis uh, QC, as he then was, both saying this is a case where we should have had a, an FDR, um, that would have been proportionate. Um, Mr. Um, Nicholas Francis QC um, said that at a time where the parties had already spent one million in costs, certainly from, from his lordship's purview, this was a case which would have, that would have, that was a case which would have um, benefited from an FDR. And so um, there are various permutations where the, you may want to think about having a FDR at a stage before a preliminary issue hearing, maybe even before witness statements or even before disclosure, just on points of claim, or, or maybe some other different sort of variation of that, um, depending on how simplistic or indeed clear cut a, a case would be. Um, I think that's probably all, all I, I have in my, my segment. Thank you, Max. I hope everyone appreciates this is probably the first time that a group of barristers have all kept to their time estimates. Um, I'm going to be speaking about very briefly about the applicable law. I am conscious that this is a lunchtime seminar and not a law lecture. Um, so this is going to be very much a bird's eye view. And I'm going to really constrain myself to five broad points. Um, the first one is that the applicable legal principles in an intervener case are going to be principles of property law, principles of trust law. The court will not be exercising the broad discretion that exists between spouses um, in a standard MCA application. Now, that point has been underlined several times in the authorities, most famously by um, Mostyn in TL and ML, but put most comprehensively by Lord Justice Hughes, as he then was in the case of Goldstone, 2011, EWCA Civ 39, which is that the applicable law in intervener cases, quote, differs importantly from the law to be applied between the wife and husband. The court is not performing a discretionary exercise, but is determining issues of property law and associated fact. It is salutary for family practitioners to keep that distinction clearly in mind, unquote. So in other words, in an intervener case, the family court, which normally wouldn't have jurisdiction to deal with the Talata claim, is applying to larger principles. So instead of taking what's effectively an objective stance, which is objectively speaking, what is a fair outcome in this case, the investigation is very much a subjective one. What did the parties have in mind? What was their common intention, etc. <clears throat> the second point is really burden of proof. An intervener needs to prove his or her case on the balance of probabilities, otherwise the claim will be dismissed. Now, this is a very basic concept in law, but it is very different from what we as family lawyers are used to in more typical financial remedy cases. Um, the court's role in a typical financial case, financial remedies case, has been described as quasi-inquisitorial. There is a well-known extract from a judgment of Lord Justice Thorpe in a case called Para and Para, 2002, EWCA Civ 1886, where he distinguishes the role of the family judge, which is to uh, the, the, the overarching obligation of looking for fairness, requires the court to consider issues which are relevant to outcome, even if they haven't been raised by other party. Um, compare that to the more adversarial system you have in civil claims in which you have an in intervener case, where essentially the court is being called on to um, determine the facts which have been relied on and um, consider essentially on a, on a rather binary um, approach whether or not those facts have been proven. I mean, it, it's we live in an increasingly siloed legal world where people tend to be specialist in one or other fields, and it is important to bear that distinction in mind. For those of you who are old enough, and those of you who can remember television from the early 1980s, there was a program called Wurzel Gummidge. And a rather scary program, Wurzel Gummidge, was the lead character, John Pertwee, used to dislodge his head and put on a different kind of head, dancing head, um, uh, thinking head. And that's essentially what we're all doing in intervener cases. We're taking off our discretionary family heads, what's the fair outcome, and we're slotting into place what is basically civil head. What was considered at the time? What did the parties have in their mind? 
Do we put a, a ticker across by this factual dispute? Do we put a ticker across by the declaration which is sought? Third point, and this is going to be very much a, a counter through the principles. You'll all be aware of the leading cases in constructive trust, Stack and Dowden, Jones and Kernett. Um, the first question essentially being, does the case come within what Baroness Hale described as the domestic consumer context? Generally speaking, these sort of cases will do. Um, typically, a constructive trust requires proof of common intention. Um, detriment and possibly conscionability. The, the issue of whether or not detriment remained a necessary component of a constructive trust has been conclusively resolved in the affirmative by the Court of Appeal in Hudson and Hathaway 2022 EWCA Civ 1648. Other species of equitable claim are available and the other which may come into play as a resulting trust, this may arise where the parties are domestically linked, but the property is one which was acquired as an investment. Um, generally speaking, the courts prefer to adopt a constructive trust approach, but in cases such as Laska, 2008, EWCA, Civ 347, and more recently, Mar and Collie, 2017, UKPC 17, there are situations in which the court will consider these sort of cases on a resulting trust approach, where the, the one is dealing less with a question of fair shares and more a question of um, any interest that is established being determined, being commensurate to the original financial contributions. Fourth point, and this is really underlining a point that both Rees and Max have already made, bear in mind that the question of whether to join a third party, the question of whether to have a preliminary issue claim is very much a discretionary one. There is a recent decision by Mr. Justice Peel, which I would describe as a three star decision. In other words, when you're kind of reviewing the um, authorities, there's a, there are, you know, some you put one star by. This is, you know, this is three star. This is important. This is a case called Svetskov and Karova, 2023 EWFC 130. It's really important, first of all, in relation to conduct within financial remedies, which isn't part of this um, webinar, but it also contains a very helpful um, paragraph, paragraph 25, which um, makes the following point, quote, ordinarily in financial remedy proceedings, it matters little as between a husband and wife in whose name an asset is beneficially held. The court has wide dispositive powers to adjust ownership as part of its overall determination of the fair outcome. An exception to this general proposition is where a third party asserts a beneficial interest, which may require determination. I say may, in inverted commas, because it will depend on the overall scale of the assets, proportionality, and relevance. And I have been involved in intervener cases where the subject of the litigation was relatively small, 30, 40,000 pounds in issue, and the costs can very easily overtake that. So if one is going down this line, bear in mind, there is it is a discretionary approach in terms of whether or not to whether, whether or not as a matter of case management, the court will um, join and allow these to proceed. Finally, finally, for me, at least, this is a word of warning. Um, I've always had a bit of a rule of thumb in intervener cases and Talata cases more generally, which is that in any given Talata case or any given intervener case, there's probably somebody who's got the case or the law wrong. And if it isn't the judge or one of the solicitors or your opponent, you better make sure it isn't you. Um, these, This is litigation which can go wrong. And let's bear in mind, a bad day in a financial remedies case is a judge coming out with a smaller assessment of needs or possibly you know, reducing the award that might have been achieved if the case had been evidentially put in a better foot. A bad day in an intervener case is that the case is dismissed and there's probably gonna be a costs order. So the stakes really are high and anybody who's interested in uh, reading judgments, not only for their sort of professional education, but also because they're quite entertaining reads, 
um, will be well worth reading a judgment of uh, Stephen um, Wildblood, uh, his honor judge Stephen Wildblood, KC, Udin and Udin, also referred to earlier by Max, 2022, EWFC 75. It's, a, it's an example of an intervener case that goes catastrophically wrong. And the essence of that case can be picked up, like all good judgments, in the very first paragraph, which reads as follows. These are feral, unprincipled, and unnecessarily expensive financial remedy proceedings. I'll leave you to read the rest of it. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say in terms of um, the principles. So I'm going to pass over now to Helen. Thank you very much. Um, I have the exciting task of talking to you about costs, and I'm also going to refer to Goldstone, uh, the case uh, which um, at least uh, two of my predecessors have discussed. Uh, but Goldstone also uh, involved uh, joinder um, uh, of a foreign entity, and that's the first thing that we would be considering here. Uh, make, the point has already been made that Goldstone, uh, the principle in Goldstone is that the FPR applies rather than the CPR, and that's relevant to the cost point. Uh, but, um, of course, it also is relevant to the fact that you can uh, join uh, foreign entities and foreign persons much more easily uh, in um, family proceedings than you can in civil proceedings. You don't need permission uh, to serve outside of the jurisdiction in family proceedings. You certainly do in uh, most civil proceedings, depending on where it is. Um, and you need to prove your gateway through which you could affect service. And you don't have that here. So it, think, it means that people are, um, as Reese has already suggested, quite um, keen to join people when they may not necessarily want to, including those outside of the jurisdiction. They can find themselves in situations where they're dealing with complicated cross-border issues uh, as well as, uh, and the costs that are in, uh, significantly increased as a result of that rather than dealing with it domestically if you can and dealing without joinder if you can. Um, so the rules then that apply are um, Family Procedure Rule 2010, uh, Rule 28 and in particular uh, 28.2 and of course Rule 28 provides that, that the uh, court may make at oh, 28.1 provides that the court may at any time make such order for costs as it thinks just, uh, and 28.2 applies because these are not financial remedy proceedings when you involve interveners. Um, and so 28.3 does not apply. 28.3 provides for the general rule uh, in financial remedy proceedings, uh, which is uh, that uh, you would um, that uh, no order is to costs is the general principle. Uh, but uh, since these are interveners, once you join a, a party, a third party, then you're looking at the provisions of 28.2 because they do not become a financial remedy proceedings. Uh, and so parts of the civil procedure rules in relation to costs then apply. Um, subject to rule 28.3, which doesn't apply, parts 44, uh, except rules 44.22, so that's cost follow the event, uh, being the general rule, and three, and 44.102 and three, uh, 46, 47, and rule 44, 5.8 for CPR um, applies to costs in proceedings with some very limited uh, modifications. Uh, so, what does then that mean in uh, intervener proceedings? Well, it means that we have what's known as a clean sheet approach. So we start with a completely clean sheet that was provided for in Baker and Rowe, uh, 2009, EWCA CIV 1162 per uh, Lord Justice Ward at paragraph 35, because orders might well have been made in ancillary relief proceedings, but they're not orders for nor even in connection with ancillary relief. And so the rule on costs must be construed purpose, purposively, as uh, my Lord explained in Judge and Judge and in his judgment above, proceedings between interveners do not come within the ambit of the rule and the judge making the cost order has therefore a wide discretion. Um, the uh, clean sheet then uh, means 
in effect, as was pointed out in the first edition of the Dictionary of uh, Talata and Inheritance uh, Act claims, that it's a soft costs follow the event regime. Um, you, we had to have a starting point that was identified in the case of Gojkovic, uh, per Lady Justice Butler Sloss. Uh, that is a 1991 case, 2 FLR 233, 1992, 1 or ER 267. Uh, the starting point is that the loser pays the winner's costs. So if you have joined someone and they then win their claim as to uh, their assertion that they have an interest in a property which the uh, another party was saying that they didn't, or that they shouldn't have, uh, then you are likely to be paying, or your client is likely to be paying that person's cost. So you need to think about that before you uh, even start considering joinder. Um, that is the starting point. And then you add uh, to your clean sheet what uh, might then fall on that side of it. Uh, and that was um, discussed uh, by. Uh, Mr. Justice Mostyn in uh, KS and ND Schedule 1 case, uh, an appeal uh, and cost point, but Schedule 1 also applied. But he sets out in that uh, case from paragraph 17 onwards uh, that the uh, you would put various points on the side of your clean sheet, on one side of the column of your clean sheet before you balance it against the other side. Um, so, the, uh, you have to look at who has won in inverted commas um, and look at then uh, what uh, offers have been made, how people have behaved and balance that all out. Uh, in uh, that case, in fact, what happened was that the, uh, the father won his case uh, and he, uh, uh, the mother sought her costs, but she didn't uh, ultimately get them. Uh, and then the father, having won the appeal, uh, managed to obtain his costs as well there. And there were arguments about costs in relation to that. In effect, it becomes satellite litigation uh, in relation to costs, something that civil practitioners are really quite um, happy to deal with. But family practitioners, not so often. They don't like that anywhere near as much and including family judges. Um, you may find that your judge at the end of the day, as Reese has already pointed out, might punt it off into uh, the main proceedings, the question of costs or otherwise, uh, might list it on another day for you to argue about costs, which is something that we're not generally uh, used to in uh, family proceedings, particularly not in the smaller money cases where you've only got a, a limited amount of time. Um, part 36 offers are relevant in civil. They are not relevant in family. They don't apply because there's no CPR um, provisions uh, applying here other than the particular points made in Rule 28.2 of the FPR. But call to bank offers uh, can be made, should be made, and uh, are very effectively made. You can, of course, uh, make open offers. Open offers are always helpful, uh, but um, called to bank offers will be taken into account at the conclusion of a, um, a contested hearing. And so if you're looking at called to bank offers, that means without prejudice, save us to cost. So they're not brought into um, play during the course of the proceedings, but when it comes to the end of the proceedings, uh, either party can then refer to it. That's the contract that you have entered into when you agree to exchange call to bank offers. Uh, and, um, and if you find that you have not beaten your call to bank offer or the other side's call to bank offer, then you may find yourself on the end of a cost order even where you have won. So uh, that also needs to be taken carefully into account when considering at the start whether you're going to join anybody. And if you are, bear in mind what the potential implications are. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, we've got just about five minutes to um, 
cover some tips and traps. We've also received three or four very good questions. I'm not going to read them out because they're quite lengthy, but the first one relates to how it would be possible to protect um, the interest of a spouse where the family home was held by somebody um, other than her and her husband, and the decree absolute has now been made. And I think, Rhys, you might have a response to this. Yes, thank you, Alex. So it's a tricky point, I think, um, but the question that I can see that has been posed in writing asks, how do you protect the, the interest pending the issue of proceedings? And I think I would turn around the question in the first instance and say, well, actually crack on issue proceedings and put that property in issue within the proceedings. And so you've got a pending land action. So that's that's one way around it. Um, uh, the, the difficulty that I can see in the, the written question, there's also um, a, a query about the land registry not having approved the RX1. Now, of course, you can set up your, your claim for beneficial interest um, in an RX1 as a basis of having a restriction. And my understanding, uh, and of course, councillor is slightly more removed from the practicalities of this, is that the as soon as the claim is in, um, it doesn't have to be approved as such, even if it's disputed, and the RX1 will bite pending a further um, uh, dispute and possibly going off to the first tier tribunal, which is very expensive. And that's why I'm saying just issue um, uh, proceedings and have it as a pending land action. Um, there may be a sort of an administrative thing about making sure that the land registry has actually looked at it and there isn't a delay between um, it arriving and then being looked at in the post bag sort of 14 days later or 56 days later or however delayed the land registry is but that might be dealt with by getting on the phone and telling them that that's an extremely urgent thing and needs to be dealt with and then lastly um, a much underused power and it, it, there's some useful material about it in Nigel Dyer's book on detection and preservation of family assets, sometimes referred to as the pink book. Um, but um, there's section 46 of the Land Registration Act, um, which allows the court to direct the registrar of the land registry um, to enter a charge onto the title. And so if you were in circumstances where you didn't couldn't quite justify um, a section 37 injunction, um, it may be on the facts of the case, if my other suggestions don't work, that you could consider an application under Section 46. Thank you. A couple of minutes left. Should we just do a quick couple of one lines each in terms of tips and traps? Um, Helen, do you want to just give your um, tip and trap here or just your tip? Yeah, tip and trap. Um, be pragmatic. It's already been referred to before. But watch out uh, as to what is the actual practical situation on the ground. What is a judge going to find at the end if he's heard all the evidence? Princess Tessie of Luxembourg found that despite there being a TR1, which provided for her husband and her husband's father to have a joint uh, tenancy in relation to the family home, actually it was all owned by uh, the Grand Duke administration um, and she didn't she just had a license to live there terminable on six months notice which was a nuptial settlement but there wasn't any point in varying it because it wouldn't be in her favor um, and that also applies in much smaller cases uh, where you may have a property put, held in the name of one husband or son uh, but actually all the monies have been provided by the um, uh, parents of the one side of the family and it's intended as a home for that family not for the leaving wife who is getting divorced um, and you may find yourself in a very expensive situation if you seek to argue that the son has a, a direct interest in that property it may not be worth one max do you have a tip or trap if a third party is not joined the court's decision doesn't bind them so that's even where a third party is invited to intervene but declines to, or if they've got knowledge of the proceedings. So, I mean, the intervener does not need to consent to join her. So we saw that in, there's a line of cases, Richard, Sun, Ruhan and Ruhan, where the, you know, uh, the ordinary financial remedy proceedings, 2017, 
um, party was invited to intervene, did not do so. Findings were made, namely that the unjoined third party was a nominee for the husband, but smash cut to 2021, the wife um, was required to apply to the, for those findings to apply to a third party. So um, will not apply unless you're, you are joined. OK, I think the guillotine is about to come down. I'm just going to say, get everything ready at the front end, get it ready at the outset. You need to know what you're going to say and your evidence and everything really before you begin. You can't free wheel as you sometimes can in financial remedies. Um, I think that's probably as far as we can take it. It's 1.45. Um, I think that will come to an end. Um, thank you all very much for coming along, and I hope this has been uh, helpful and informative. Good afternoon. Thank you very much.